uh, the director for the Extreme Project Puerto Rico, and, is that wrong? Challenge. Extreme Challenge Puerto Rico. They changed it like five times, I swear. Every time I come up with something new. Uh, but this man, when he was younger, he loved coming fishing up at Lake Erie and filling five gallon buckets with bass, so he may not be Jesus, but he might be able to feed 5,000. <laughs> Help me give a warm welcome to Chris Westman. Definitely not Jesus. <laughs> it feels weird being in this row here. So uh, on the summers, on the summers we would go uh, on vacation to Kelly's Island in Lake Erie. Has anybody ever been to Kelly's Island in Lake Erie? One. Over here. That's it. Two. two three, four. three. Four. Okay. All right. <laughs> and we would the, the white bass come in kind of like piranha, and uh, you know these big schools, and uh, you, you literally almost every cast you catch a fish when you catch uh, I don't know hundred. At the time, fill up five gallon buckets. It was awesome growing up. Okay, um, so this evening we are going to tackle the topic uh, redeeming culture issues related to race, ethnicity, religion, and the kingdom of God. It's a big topic. Uh, I am not an expert in this area, uh, but I do know Jesus, and he has a few things to say about it. And so I'm just going to jump right in. Uh, if, if you paid attention at all to the news in 2016 and 2017, you would know that the recent history here in the United States and really all over the world have not been the best of times when it comes to race relations, uh, issues of justice, political power, uh, and how people of dif different ethnic, religious, and cultural backgrounds has, have been getting along. I'm going to share just a few stories that have made national headlines. Uh, some of you may be aware of the fatal shootings by police, police officers of three black men, Calandro Castile, uh, Alton Sterling, and Delron Small. According to one news source, in 2016, U.S. police killed 258 black people. In response to all the reports of police brutality in 2016, Colin Kaepernick, the quarterback for the uh, San Francisco 49ers, decided to take a knee during the playing of the national anthem to call attention to the need for social change and justice for black people in America. This gave rise to a whole host of opinions about whether or not what he was doing was appropriate. So whether you agree or not with what Kaepernick did, it raised awareness on a national scale to issues of police brutality and other race-related injustices in America. On the other hand, in 2016, we saw a 56% increase in the number of police killed in the line of duty over the previous year. <coughs> On July 7th of 2016, a sniper killed five law enforcement officers and wounded nine others at a peaceful rally against police brutality in Dallas, Texas. Then less than two weeks later, a lone gunman in Baton Rouge shot and killed three officers and wounded three others outside a convenience store in the weeks after a black man, 37-year-old Alton Sterling, was shot and killed by a police during a struggle by a policeman during the struggle. In addition to all of this, there's a fierce battle waging right now about what to do with all of the illegal immigrants who are living in America coming over the border illegally from Mexico. Should the United States build a wall on the Mexican border? Does the U.S. have a right to protect its borders? What do we do with all of the illegal immigrants living in America right now? What about all the children of illegal immigrants whose parents might be deported? And then there are the issues related to Muslims all over the world. What do we do with all the refugees from war-torn, predominantly Muslim nations who are fleeing to Western European nations in the United States? This is to say nothing of the terrorist attacks at the hand of radical Islamic terrorists that we hear about in the news, not only here in the U.S., but all over the world almost on a weekly basis. And if you've been listening to the news, even just recently, there's an unprecedented rise uh, in threats to Jewish community centers across America. Just this year alone, Jewish community centers in 27 states and one Canadian province have received 69 bomb threats. These are, few, these are just a few of the big stories. They're making national news. But what about the so-called small stories? In an article entitled, Talking to Our Children About Racism and Diversity, here are some of the questions and concerns that parents have raised 
as they talk to their children uh, about their growing awareness of race, ethnicity, and religion. According to one parent, she said, after her talking about her child, she said, she said, after her first day of kindergarten, my daughter mentioned that Carla, the only Spanish speaking child in her class, talks weird. Why would she say something like that? Her mother said. Another parent said, when we were driving home from the park, my five year old, uh, my five -year -old suddenly said, Mom, I wish I were white. We live in a mixed neighborhood, but I thought he had a positive self-esteem and a strong African-American identity. I felt like a failure. Another parent said after watching a news report about a racially motivated crime, the burning of a cross on the lawn of a Korean-American family, my son turned to me and asked, why don't white people like us? I was speechless. Another parent said, my wife and I are African-American and light-skinned, as is our eight-year-old daughter. Several of her African-American friends have been teasing her about being white. She came home crying the other day. I feel so badly for her. What should I do? And I want to just pause here for a second. And I want us all to take just a little bit of an emotional inventory. How does all of that make you feel? How does it make you feel? What thoughts are running through your mind as you hear these stories? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's more going on. I could probably talk for two hours about racial issues, religious issues, things that are going on in our world. According to psychologists, there's, there are four basic emotions, glad, sad, mad, and scared. Every emotion, generally speaking, can be categorized in those, under those four ca categories. What would you say you're feeling when you hear these things? Mad, glad, sad, or scared? For me, I feel sad that a five-year-old black boy wishes he was white. That makes me sad. I wish he could say what the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me in my mother's womb. I praise you. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. I wish he could say that. It makes me mad that people around the world are being judged and killed because of the color of their skin, because of uniform that they're wearing, or because they might have a different religion or come from a different country. And all the stuff that's happening in the world makes me scared. I'm scared for myself, and I think of my kids, 15 and 12, that this is the world that they're growing up in. It makes me scared. So what do we do with all these emotions? What do we do with all these realities that are facing our world when it comes to all the tragedies that we experience regarding race, religion, ethnic diversity, and all the social, social injustices we're seeing, not just now, but that we've witnessed all throughout human history? One of the things I'm excited about today is a little bit later we're going to have a panel. That's kind of why I'm going early here. We're going to get to hear some stories, how people have processed issues of race relations, uh, diversity, and how the gospel relates to that. And so what I want to do before that panel comes up is I want to speak to you tonight as followers of Jesus Christ. As followers of Christ, what can we do? What should we do? How can we redeem this area of brokenness that we encounter in our world. How can the kingdom of God come and reign in this world? What is our role? Now, I'm not gonna answer every one of these questions tonight. I couldn't do it. It's gonna take a lifetime journey to deal with these issues. But what I wanna do tonight is give you a place to start. To start thinking about these issues. I want you to think about the things I say, and I want you to start to process the people who come up here and share tonight. And what does it mean for you as a follower of Jesus Christ? And so the place I want to start is this. Very simply, we need to see all of this the way God sees it. Pretty simple. We need to see the way God sees. We need to start by getting our minds right about the realities of the issues that we are facing from his perspective. God has something to say about all of this. 
And so here's what I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give what I call three God perspectives that we must be willing to embrace to bring the kingdom of God to a divided world. Three God perspectives or, or three lenses that God looks at the world that you and I live in when it comes to these issues. The first one is this. It has to do with the image of God, and it's very simply this. Every human being on planet Earth is created in the image of God and therefore deserves to be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of their race, regardless of their religion, regardless of their socioeconomic status, regardless of their culture, regardless of whatever country they come from. From everybody deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. Everybody. Genesis 1.27 says it this way. It says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What's amazing about this is everybody is infused with the glorious image of God. There is nothing in all of the universe that is more like God than human beings, than each of you here in this room. You have the character, you have many of the attributes that God has. My little dog at home doesn't have any of those, but you do. And so I need to treat you with more dignity and respect than I treat the animals, because they don't have the image of God. Everybody deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. And so when you think about this, you have never locked eyes with another human being who's not supremely valuable in God's sight. Never. Never have you looked at another person, no matter where they're coming from, how similar they are to you or how different they are than you. You've never locked eyes with another human being that's supremely <laughs> valuable in his sight. All of us, regardless, and I would say also precisely because of our skin color, our race, our culture, our reflections of God's glory in the world. We all reflect him. So think about that for a moment. Every time you look at someone different than you, think about that reality. This person deserves my respect. This person deserves to be treated with dignity. And think about it also when you have any negative thought about yourself, right? We shouldn't be thinking negatively about ourselves because we're all created in the image of God. One of my all-time favorite lines uh, is from a movie called The Health, which I would recommend uh, everyone to watch in terms of dealing with issues of, of race. But in, in the movie The Health, there's a black maid who is uh, basically raising uh, this white family's uh, children. And there's a little girl in the story and this black maid, with this little white girl sitting on her uh, lap, says to her, you is smart, you is kind, you is important. Have you guys heard that or seen that? I mean, that makes me, that, like, I'm a teary-eyed guy when I hear that kind of stuff, <laughs> you know? And that's what God says, you is important, you is important. We need to hear that all the time. What are you laughing about? That's my <laughs> wife back there, <laughs> next to Ashley. <laughs> So that's the first reality we need to be willing to embrace if we're going to bring the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. The second one is this. Every human being on planet earth is a, uh, is a broken image bearer of God and in need of restoration. Okay? So while we all are infused with the glorious image of God, none of us reflect his image perfectly because of sin. We're broken. We don't always live up to that standard that that he wants us to. And because of that, that brokenness affects every area of our lives. It affects, it, it affects us as individuals, and it affects the institutions that individuals make up, whether they're governments, or universities, or sports teams, or businesses, you name it. Broken image bearers affect everything. Romans 3.23 says it this way, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We all fall short of the glory we're meant to reflect in the world, God's glory. And there's consequences for this. I'm going to look at three consequences of this brokenness, this broken reality. Our sinfulness, our brokenness, corrupts our relationship with God. It corrupts our relationship with ourselves. And it corrupts our relationship with others. This is our reality. 
and we need to live in it. So let's look at each of those. Corrupted relationship with God. Because of our sin, according to the Bible, we're cut off from God. We don't have a relationship with him. We're spiritually dead. And so apart from him, there's all kinds of people all around the world trying to navigate life apart from him. And they'll never find what life is meant to be and meant to be lived like apart from him. And so we put our, we put our trust in ourselves. We put our, our trust in uh, political institutions, politicians, religious leaders, social movements, or whatever we can do to try to overcome these personal and institutional deficiencies. And the reality is they all fall short. The implication is that you and I need to be restored to a right relationship with God. That's our only hope. I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. We're corrupted in our relationship with God. We're corrupted in our relationship with ourselves. And what ends up happening, and this is really profound, think about this. Because of this corrupt relationship we have with ourselves, we tend to have either too high a view of ourselves or too low a view of ourselves. Some people think that they're superior because of their race, because of their ethnic heritage, because of their country of origin or the color of their skin. That creates problems. We also have too low a view of ourselves, and a lot of people feel inferior to others for those same reasons. That creates problems as well. And the gospel is the only solution. We have corrupted relationships with others as well. This broken image of God in us, that's what happens. Why do you think the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, he says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Is this your Bible, Carl? Carter. Oh, Carter. So the, the Old Testament, it says the whole, the, uh, where's Carter? Right. Oh, there you are, yeah, you're good. I'll be nice to it. This is really nice. So what he, he says, he says, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is a study Bible, so it's pretty thick. But roughly, holy smokes. <laughs> He's, in that context, he's ultimately referring to the Old Testament, which is roughly this part of the Bible over here. You can fulfill all this if you do one thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. It's that simple. So why would Paul say that? The reality is it's because we don't always love people the way we should. We don't think about other people's perspectives in the way they want to be loved. We love them the way we want to love them, not the way they want to be loved. If we just, if the, imagine how different the world would be if everybody just said, hey, how do you want to be loved? And everybody did it. Could you imagine what this world would be like? What would that be? That'd be heaven, wouldn't it? So imagine a world where everyone obeyed this command. Racism would end immediately. There'd never be another war. We'd never have to have another conversation about social injustices. The murder rate would go to zero. People would never be judged and treated differently just because they look different, dress different, speak different, or act different. So because we are broken and sinful and as, as a result have this corrupted relationship with God, ourself, and others, there's ultimately only one solution to all these problems from God's perspective. Which leads to the third God perspective we must be willing to embrace, and that's this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only solution to our desperate need for restoration. What's that? Okay. So, very simply, the gospel is this. We were created to live under God's loving rule as our creator, but we're guilty of insurrection. We don't want to follow him. We don't want to obey his rules. And so what God has done is he's given us over to all those things that shouldn't be done. We think things, we say things, we do things that are against the will of God every day and we don't reflect his glory as we should. But even in this insurrection, God said, hey, I love you and I want you back. He sent his son to die on the cross for every one of our rebellious thoughts and actions to bring us back into him, to put us back in that proper relation where he is king and we are the followers. And so for those who are willing to turn from their insurrection and embrace Jesus, as their savior and leader, he grants them the gift of life in this world and in the life to come. He gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers them to become all that God ultimately wants them to be. So it's only as we come to embrace the gospel and flesh out all of its implications 
that we will be able to begin to experience the reconciliation, wholeness, and oneness uh, in a world that has been ravaged by the effects of sin. So think about this just for a second. Implications. You see, the gospel says that when someone comes to faith in Jesus Christ, he becomes part of the universal family of God. So that moment that I came to faith in Christ, I got brothers from Asia, from Africa, from mid the, the Middle East, from uh, Latin America. Uh, I became brothers with American Indians uh, and with India Indians, the ones from India, right? That's what happens when you come to faith in Christ. And God says, now the most important thing is your relationship with me and the family of God. Now get after it. Start living like a family. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6 says this, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all. Our ethnic heritage, our socioeconomic class, the color of our skin, that stuff doesn't matter. It makes us who we are, but that's not what unites us. The whole other issue we can talk about there. The gospel tells me, Jesus says this, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Imagine if everybody just loved their enemies. It'd be a different world, wouldn't it? That's what the gospel calls us to do and to live. So I'm not going to repeat them. Michael, you can throw that last slide up there. Those are the three God perspectives we need to embrace. If we're going to see the kingdom of God come here in our lives and see, and see the restoration and reconciliation that we all long for. Natasha is going to come up and lead a panel discussion, and I'll let you explain how that's going to go.